Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar today on Imagine Aging, Irish Culture and Society. Uh, we're joined by a very interesting panel and very much looking forward to the discussion. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute and we're hosting the webinar and we're doing so on behalf of our colleagues here at NUI Galway, Tony Tracy and Michaela Shaga Fua. Uh, Tony, could I turn over to you for an introduction to today's event? Hi, Dan, and uh, hi everybody who's joining us from all kinds of places. We have a, a big house today and we're really delighted about that. So let me just say a couple of uh, very quick uh, general introductory comments. Um, the first is that this is the first of a planned series of webinars in the new normal, as they say, uh, around the theme of aging and the humanities. Uh, it forms part of a larger project uh, that we're involved with at NUI Galway, a pan-European project called Mask Age images of aging masculinities in European literatures and cinemas. Um, this is one of the first events that we've uh, conducted here uh, at NUI Galway. It follows uh, other ones uh, across Europe and it will last for approximately two years. So the idea behind today's webinar is not really to uh, present a conference type setting, but rather to begin a conversation, introduce some themes and topics uh, uh, for future use and invite you, uh, the participants, uh, to participate today and perhaps uh, along the way uh, to our future events and publications. Um, and in that regard, we decided to uh, follow on from our colleagues in Trinity and UCD and elsewhere in Ireland uh, and conversations that they have already also been having about aging and invite a range of approaches uh, and experts on the field here today. So that's what we'll be doing. We'll be offering a range of approaches uh, rather than a range of answers uh, to this theme in an Irish uh, context. Um, and at the end of the webinar, Michaela will speak a little bit about our planned uh, future projects and invite your participation there. So again, thanks very much for showing up. I hope you find it stimulation, uh, stimulating and interesting. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. So uh, I'm gonna be chairing today and my, my first uh, my responsibility is to introduce uh, the panelists, so I'll, I'll do that in the order in which they're, they're speaking. And then we will move in a panel discussion format to some individual presentations, uh, followed by a more open discussion. We certainly invite your comments and questions and participation. There's a Q&A uh, function that you'll see uh, and also a chat function. So please do uh, participate in that manner. And thank you again for joining us. We have a distinguished panel, as I mentioned, and we're gonna cover some very interesting ground today. Um, our first speaker is Professor Des O'Neill. Des is a consultant geriatrician at the Talley University Hospital. He's chair of the National Center for Arts and Health, and he is co-chair of Medical and Health Humanities at TCD. Uh, Des's research interests cover neuroscience, aging, and the humanities, with a particular interest in dementia. He's, and he's the first Irish gerontologist to be awarded fellowship of the Gerontological Society of America, and the first Irish geriatrician to be awarded fellowship of the American Geriatric Society. Next, we'll hear from Heather Ingman, uh, who is a uh, visiting research fellow uh, in the School for Gender and Women's Studies at Trinity College, Dublin. Heather has published widely on Irish writing, uh, including books such as A History of the Irish Short Story, Irish Women's Fiction from Edgeworth to Enright, and Aging in Irish Writing, which came out in 2018. Uh, she's currently working on a study of Elizabeth Bowen, which will be published in 2021. Tony Tracy, uh, who you just heard from, um, is a lecturer in film studies at NUI Galway. Tony is PI on the Irish team of Mask Age, the GenderNet Plus project, Gendering Age, Representations of Masculinities and Aging in Contemporary European Literatures and Cinemas. Tony has written extensively on Irish cinema and recently co-authored the Historical Dictionary of Irish Cinema. Michaela Schragafuhr is lecturer in German at NUI Galway. Uh, Michaela is co-founder of the Women in Aging Research Network and co-editor of three collections on the theme of women in aging. She is currently part of the Irish research uh, team of the project Masculinities and Aging in Contemporary Literatures and Cinemas at NUI Galway. And Griffin is the author of When All Is Said, the number one Irish bestseller and winner of the 2019 Newcomer of the Year at the Irish Book Awards. When All Is Said has been published in the UK, US and Canada and translated into 20 languages. And short story works have featured in amongst others, The Irish Times and The Singing Fly and they've been read on Radio 4. 
Anya Nilema is Deputy Director at the Irish Centre for Social Gerontology at NUI Galway. Anya's research focuses on the social aspects of ageing and most recently on gender, ageing and extended working life. She's currently working on an EU funded pro project that we heard about, Mask Age, which is a cross national project exploring, as we know, aging masculinities. Maggie O'Neill researches 20th century and contemporary Irish literature and culture. Uh, she has special interests in aging studies and the medical humanities. She's currently a postdoctoral researcher in NUI Galway in the GenderNet project, Gendering Age Representations of Masculinities and Aging. And she was previously project coordinator for the Gender Arc Research Consortium in the University of Limerick. Very much looking forward to everybody's participation today. Our first speaker, uh, as I've in indicated, is Des O'Neill. So, Des, I very much look forward to your contribution. Thanks very much. To, to, am I on? Good. Thanks very much to Dan, Tony, and indeed to Michaela and the ICSG for this opportunity to have a, a broad ranging discussion around aging. Um, as you heard already, I'm a geriatrician, but I'm very involved with the medical humanities and arts and health. And these are hugely, hugely important ways of getting the bigger picture, of understanding what's really going on, of understanding the meaning of being well, of being ill, of, of the journeys through healthcare uh, in a way that uh, perhaps otherwise the more mechanical technical aspects may actually hide from us in the way that Michel Foucault, for example, talked about the medical gaze and indeed there's a nursing gaze and a social worker gaze, psychologist gaze, whatever. So aging, what a fantastic, fantastic uh, development for our culture, for our humanity. The 20th century saw two extraordinary social changes, both of which should have been very welcome. The first was the effective elimination or minimization of child and infant mortality from the late 19th into the early 20th century. And when all these children survived, these infants survived to become members of our family, did anybody say, how will we cope? What will we do with all of these extra children? Goodness me. The second major change, however, has really evoked a much more ambivalent response. And that has been the progressive increase in all of our longevity. And this has almost uh, doubled in a century. And indeed, given uh, improvements in everything from sewage to education, most of us are going to live not only a longer, but a healthier old age. But sadly, sadly, popular images and perceptions suffer from what we in gerontology and other areas called structural lag, where a very major change happens in society relatively quickly. And yet our ways of thinking, our institutions, our processes are moored back at an earlier age. So very often around aging, we hear what is known as apocalyptic demography. So instead of welcoming the fact that we're going to become into our 80s and into our 90s, healthier, fitter, the prevalence and incidence of Alzheimer's disease, for example, dropping in most of our most Western civilizations, uh, we hear really tales of almost woe. And the Irish Citizens Assembly was a very bleak, uh, reminder of this and of the danger perhaps of resorting to Vox Pop where instead of us seeing the longevity dividend the fact that we have gained enormously by uh, living into later life it was all about the costs of pensions and the costs of health care and disability and failed to recognize uh, the broader picture which is oh my goodness we're all going to live longer by one calculation if we had the same lifespan as our grandparents, but put our longevity into increased days, we'd have an extra five hours a day compared to our grandparents. We'd have a 29 hour day. We've been given an extra five hours a day compared to our grandparents. And sometimes I, I feel the way we treat this is some like the way the Spanish conquistadores didn't know what to do with platinum and they threw it into the sea not realizing that it was just as valuable as gold. So how do we start developing a matrix, a framework, whereby we can begin to understand the true meanings of aging, understand 
how can we tease out and explain to others the idea of the longevity dividend, that which we've gained from aging. So just a little bit of terminology to people uh, around the table and who are listening in. Gerontology, geriatrics, geriatric medicine, I've heard of these things. Gerontology is the broad study of aging, not necessarily about illness or death or depression or any of these things. And it's classically divided into sociology of aging, psychology of aging, of normal normative aging, biology of aging, and healthcare of aging. And in that healthcare bit is all the geriatric medicine and gerontological nursing. And indeed, to a certain extent, because I'm interested in academia, I cover a lot of the areas of gerontology. But what has become a hugely interesting area, and it really, it's one that resonates off work I do in medicine with the medical humanities, is the idea of cultural gerontology, or humanities, arts, and aging. And this is about us escaping from, even though we may, may be well-meaning in geriatric medicine, in terms of trying to illuminate and support later life, or in social gerontology, we may get caught in variants of Michel Foucault's uh, sociologist gaze or psychologist gaze or biologist gaze, and we may unconsciously retreat back to failure models of aging, disability models of aging. So this has been a really very exciting turn. And indeed, uh, I have to give great credit to Galway and the ICSG, who hosted a major meeting on this a number of years back and indeed to uh, the opportunities in a small island where we can link and connect with each other and to find ways to illustrate the uh, and understand the longevity dividend, not being a Pollyanna about it and not missing out that there are challenges at this stage of life as there are at every stage of life, but to give perspective. And one of the classic bits of perspective is moving away from the trope of the lonely older person and to realize that loneliness peaks between the age of 15 and 35 in most Western societies. So we have a major opportunity here. My own preferred tropes around late life creativity is a way of illuminating the metaphor from the great paintings of Matisse, the movies of Clint Eastwood, the songs of Leonard Cohen, the poems of Seamus Heaney or Thomas Kinsella, uh, Thomas Tranströmer, the Swedish Nobel Prize winner. Uh, these give us a fantastic insight. But the creative world is also catching up with us. And indeed, one of the movies I recommend most highly to my students, trainees, and colleagues to understand aging would be Pixar's Up, a movie on the surface for children, which starts out with infertility, lifelong disappointment, and death, um, actually catches the fact that we can engage with artists, literature, cinema, and provide a fuller picture. The key challenge to us is how to make sure is that our paths interdigitate so that it's not humanities uh, and aging without some linkage and cross-referencing to gerontology, and it's not gerontology without some linkage to the wider picture. Interdisciplinary work requires work, time, expertise, it's not something that can be done lightly, but it's through these sort of panels that we can work out ways that we can all work together and, and bounce ideas off each other and develop PhDs, doctoral programs that allow us to enjoy the fact that us as we age, that we can help society understand that this is a longevity dividend, that this is something we should welcome and embrace and avoid ageism, the most bizarre of discrimination. Most discrimination, gender, sex, ethnicity is against other people. But ageism is discrimination against our own future selves. Let's not get hoodwinked by that. And let's see how we can better explore through the humanities and arts, the richness of our longevity dividend. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Des. That was extremely helpful. I mean, methodologically interesting, the number of points to pick up on, but also providing us with a, with a, with a positive way of thinking about things, which, as you say, are culturally often denigrated. I like the idea that we're discriminating against ourselves in this context. It's very helpful. So we're now going to move on to uh, Heather Ingman. So uh, Heather, uh, can you uh, join us now?
Thanks, Heather. Thank you. So I'm going to talk on aging in Irish literature and criticism. And because it focuses on individual experiences of aging in specific cultural contexts, literature, I think, is ideally placed to resist abstract theories around aging. And yet until re recently, age was arguably a missing category in Irish literary criticism. The, in this respect, the special 2018 issue of Nordic Irish Studies, edited by Michaela and Maggie, was pioneering in this regard, drawing together in one volume the portrayal of the aging woman in Irish film, drama and literature. So at its best, literature presents the complexity of the aging process and the difficult interaction between body, self and society as we age. And I would argue that Irish writing is a particularly rich source for descriptions of aging. The theme is central, for instance, in such canonical texts as Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray and the poetry of W.B. Yeats. At the same time, much Irish writing adheres to the decline narrative of ageing. Dorian Gray lived in a cultural context that equated youth with beauty and virtue and old age with ugliness, sickness and moral failure. His famous attempt to freeze time in order to resist the aging process chimes in with some of Yeats's early poetry. Though Yeats's renewed poetic energy in the last five years of his life made some of his contemporaries feel that as Yeats aged, his poetry grew younger. Irish writing can shed light on aspects of the aging process often ignored by wider society. The voices of dementia sufferers, for example, often go unheard in our society. But some Irish writers have attempted to convey through imaginative reconstruction what dementia feels like from the inside. In her novel, There Were No Windows, Nora Holt gives a precisely observed portrait of an aging literary hostess, Claire, succumbing to the progressive stages of dementia. The accuracy of Holt's portrayal of Claire's sufferings has led her novel to be recommended for those involved in the care of dementia patients, thus confirming the vital role of fiction and imaginative reconstruction in aiding our understanding of the aging process. Other examples of fictional reconstructions of dementia include the elderly nun Sister Judith in Julia of Whelan's novel, No Country for Young Men, and Tash in Jennifer Johnson's Foolish Mortals. All three of these novels are insightful about the powerful mechanisms of ageism and sexism that weigh against the aging woman. Irish writers haven't shied away either from recreating the inner life of the bed bound and dying. Samuel Beckett's Malone Dies derives its power from its unwavering focus on the inner consciousness of the dying Malone and his rapidly diminishing world. In John McGahan's The Barracks, Elizabeth uses the time after her cancer diagnosis to reassess her life and values and this period becomes rich for her as pain and approaching death force her to formulate a personal vision of her life in opposition to the rituals and routines adhered to unthinkingly by her husband and neighbours. So Elizabeth, I think, bears out Alan Kelleher's argument in The Inner Life of the Dying Person that the prospect of imminent death may give different meaning to our lives right at the end. The Life Review, a term introduced by Robert Butler in 1963 to provide a therapeutic opportunity for the older person to explore the meaning of his or her life through autobiographical reminiscences, also provides an important bridge between gerontology and literature. And John Bonville's male narrators are particularly prone to these sort of life narratives. They're often highly conscious of signs of physical aging in themselves, and others, and lean towards a Freudian view of life of old age as akin to castration. In the sea, for example, Max in his 60s finds mirrors give back only a parody of himself, echoing Kathleen Woodward's famous inversion of Lacan's mirror stage, namely that as we age, 
the narcissistic impulse directs itself against the image in the mirror. In other words, we avoid looking at ourselves. Um, Banfield's solitary aging protagonists in his two novels, Eclipse and Shroud, are in search of identity and authenticity. As gerontologists have pointed out, this kind of quest can be particularly difficult in a postmodern society that lacks any overall binding religious or philosophical framework into which people can set their experience of aging. I really am a stranger to myself, admits Alex in Eclipse. Banville's aging and confused narrators pose a challenge to humanistic gerontologist notions of old age as a time of reflection, leading to, if all goes well, self-acceptance and a sense of fulfillment and serenity. Instead, Banville's uh, narrators often remain in a kind of existential drift. However, bearing in mind um, Professor O'Neill's talk, I'm now going to turn to more positive accounts of old age. Molly Keane's portrayal of the four swift siblings in Time After Time, who discover new abilities as they age, make this novel an example of opening out or ripening, rifles roman, to use a term coined by Barbara Waxman, to describe the journey to, towards a richer and more fulfilled self as we age. Deirdre Madden's portrait of Dan in her novel Authenticity, with his freedom from social convention and solid sense of self, comes close to the Gero transcendent ideal outlined by La Lars Tornstam. Dan's acceptance of death as a natural part of the human cycle is hard earned, achieved in solitude and mourning for his wife. His present serenity chimes in with some gerontologists' observations that despite experiences of ill health and bereavement, older people often display surprisingly high levels of well being because they've developed better emotional defences. In John McGahan's novel, That They May Face the Rising Sun, the ageing community possesses sufficient cultural resources to make the ageing process meaningful. His characters possess the kind of social interconnectivity, the way the neighbours look out for one another, regarded by gerontologists as essential to successful ageing. So far, I've focused on the novel, but in the Irish short story, ageing is also a dominant theme, as far back as the earliest, early 20th century, with the stories of Liam O'Flaherty and his portrayal of old age as part of the Earth's natural cycle. In stories by John McGahan and William Trevor, the development of the flashback under the belated influence of modernism allowed for increasing reflection on the part of ageing protagonists a sort of mini life narrative. Whilst contemporary Irish short story writers such as Mary Dorsey, Bernard McLafferty and Christine Dwyer Hickey have begun to enter directly into the consciousness of the old and confused, countering society's tendency to write off the inner world of the demented as of no importance. So in this brief time, I've tried to convey some of the richness of Irish writing as a resource for the aging theme this is true not only for fiction, which I concentrated on here, but for Irish drama, poetry and life writing, all areas highlighted in the 2018 issue of Nordic Irish Studies. But much work remains to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. That was extremely interesting. You provided a curriculum and a wonderful reading list of possibilities there for us to considering to consider I was thinking of that line in Yeats of being fastened to a dying animal but at the same time he brought out the paradox of his own discovery of youthfulness almost in his poetry and of creative expression um, that offers us a lot to to think about to consider as we move ahead Michaela now I would turn to you uh, for your contribution today so Michaela thank you thank you Dan and thanks Heather for this wonderful overview um, which is also a wonderful introduction um, to my talk, actually, on aging and masculinity in recent Irish writing. So in a recent interview about his forthcoming novel, Love, out in October, Roddy Doyle notes, nobody wants to get older, but it is rich material for writing. And he adds, less and less people will read it, the book. The book clubs are overwhelmingly women, 
and they don't want to read about aging men. So uh, regardless of this, I will highlight some representations of older men specifically in recent Irish literature. My previous projects, um, as Heather has pointed, kindly pointed out, um, conducted together with Maggie O'Neill, by the way, since 2015, focused on women and aging in various contexts. So perhaps to some extent confirming Roddy Doyle's tongue and cheek claim that women are not interested in reading about older men. Um, not really. This focus on the theme of women and aging sometimes raised the question, why focus explicitly on women when aging concerns both genders, when it concerns us all? And the answer to this seemed obvious enough in some sense in that aging seems to impact women more and sooner as they are judged more by physical appearance. Susan Sontag, for instance, has famously called this the double standard of aging that denounces women with special severity. And Kathleen Woodward, Jeanette King and others have eloquently commented on the social and sexual invisibility of women past a certain age. In Irish literature, the realities of women's aging have often been blotted out by the powerful symbol of woman as nation in its various manifestations. And writers such as Ivan Boland in poetry, or more recently, Anne Enright in her wonderful novel, The Green Road, have worked hard to revise such representations and carve a space for older women's embodied sub subjectivities. However, besides the fact that gender constructions are always interdependent, Irish literature also increasingly challenges weary cultural representations and damaging stereotypes often imposed on men. And in doing so, it uncovers their harmful effects both on the individual and on society, so the harmful effects of the gender constructions. These texts explore the embodied experiences of men in older age that are frequently at odds with characteristics associated with hegemonic masculinity, such as power, youth, virility, physical strength, and performance. The perceived loss of these attributes as men grow older is sometimes perceived as a form of emasculation, feeding into age stereotypes, for instance, of the grumpy or dirty old man as older characters seek to hold on to and reassert power and validate their masculinity. In an Irish context, um, tropes such as the overpowering family patriarch have been revisited, for instance, in Frank McGuinness's play, The Hanging Gardens, where family hierarchies are toppled and intergenerational connection is facilitated in view of the father's rapidly evolving dementia. Or, to turn to fiction, in Donald Ryan's novel, The Spinning Heart, in which the tyrannical father's inner life, including his own childhood memories of domestic violence, are revealed only in an interior monologue from beyond the grave. Literary scholars have noted that representations of men's aging tend to feed into the narrative of aging as decline that Heather also um, already mentioned, whereas representations of women's aging often explore new opportunities for growth and liberation, for instance, in the genre of the Reifungsroman, the novel of ripening. One such example is Claire Boylan's novel, Beloved Stranger, in which 80-year-old Dick Butler has not been able to settle into old age after his retirement. Showing signs of bipolar disorder and dementia, he rather melodramatically articulates this insight himself while pointing a gun at his wife. He says, no one expects their life to change, no man does. I am not an old man either, not old, merely a prisoner inside this rotting cage, having to stand by helpless, while his manliness is spat upon and kicked to the ground. This passage illustrates the extent to which this character has internalized ideals associated with hegemonic masculinity and how deeply incompatible these are with his current situation. In contrast, the novel depicts his wife Lily's growth and ripening into a content and adventurous old age. However, similar journeys of self-exploration, insight and growth can be found in recent novels featuring older men as protagonists. This often involves the characters confronting their own vulnerabilities, which in turn facilitates emotional growth and connection, and in some cases, healing. My first example is actually a work of nonfiction, Michael Harding's memoir, Staring at Lakes from 2013, which starts out like a conventional narrative of a midlife crisis. This cliched scenario, however, soon gives way to the shock of physical illness, followed by depression which in turn leads to the author's intense phys physical self-loathing 
and a sense of emasculation. The insight gained from struggling through his illness includes the gradual acceptance of his own vulnerability as he realizes, and I quote, to be vulnerable is human. And the shame that keeps us silent and makes men wear a warrior's shield at all times and pretend to be invincible is something less than human. Shame and silence make men into caricatures of humanity that crash in middle age and die alone. I was beginning to read my illness with a new mind. While Haring's insight into the damaging impact of prevalent ideals of masculinity is prompted by his own serious illness, the loss of a beloved spouse has a similar effect on the protagonists in Sebastian Barry's The Secret Scripture and more recently in Anne Griffin's um, novel When All is Said. In both novels, the protagonists experience a sense of diminished masculinity brought about by the loss of their wives, which goes hand in hand with an acute realization of their own aging and causes a reassessment of their gendered identities. In Barry's The Secret Scripture, Dr. Green, a psychiatrist in his mid sixties, starts writing a commonplace book to assess and analyze the case of his oldest patient, centenarian Roseanne McNulty. In doing so, he soon begins to reflect on his own life, especially after the death of his wife early on in the novel. It's her death that makes him acutely aware of his own aging process when, as he claims, he looks in the mirror. So this would be another mirror scene similar uh, to, to the ones Heather mentioned with regard to John Banville. So he looks in the mirror for the first time in many years and does not recognize himself, which causes him utter dismay and shock. I had not realized it while bed lived, the simple fact. I was old. I didn't know what to do. So I searched out my old razor and shaved my beard. Plagued by loneliness, guilt over mistakes in his marriage and fear of his own impending retirement, it's precisely Dr. Green's vulnerability and his sense of emasculation, again, symbolized perhaps by the shaving of his beard, that leads to his growing emotional connection to Roseanne and also facilitates his changed outlook on life and old age, including his own, and I quote, human, alone, aging, and grateful by the end of the novel. So I turn to my last example, Anne Griffin's novel, When All Is Said, um, which centers on Morris Hannigan, a wealthy farmer and landowner in his mid eighties. Morris spends what will be the last night of his life sitting by himself in a hotel bar and raising five toasts to the five most important people in his life, most notably Sadie, his recently deceased wife of 60 years. As his interior monologue progresses, Morris aligns himself with various stereotypes, ranging from the solitary drinker to the cranky arsed father, that was a quote, um, but the novel effectively complicates and challenges such labels by providing insight into his life review his thoughts, his memories, and most importantly, his regrets, especially um, at very often having failed his wife and having treated her um, badly. Towards the end of the book, he records a voice message for his son, which includes the confession that Morris is not half the man he was without his wife, Sadie, even though he never told her. Yet it's arguably through becoming half a man that Morris's life review is prompted and his inability to express his emotions is overcome, if only in his own mind. Throughout the book, his mandarin thoughts are addressed to his only son, Kevin, a successful journalist who emigrated to the US years ago. At one point, Morris notes that if his son were actually sitting beside him, none of his thoughts would be spoken out loud. So this is a crucial quote in the book. It's a rather lengthy one, so <clears throat> please bear with me. Um, and as for Irish men, I have news for you. It's worse as you get older. It's like we tunnel ourselves deeper into our aloneness, solving our problems on our own. Men sitting alone at bars, going over and over the, the same old territory in their heads. Sure, if you were sitting right beside me, son, you'd know none of this. I wouldn't know where to start. It's all grand up here in my head, but to say it out loud to the world, to a living being, it's not like we were reared to do it or taught it in school or that it was preached from the pulpit. It's no wonder that at the age of 30 or 40 or 80, no less, we just can't turn our hand to it. And I think this, is, um, this quote is a good note for my talk um, to end on, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michaela. That's really, I'm really intrigued by the idea of this, uh, this novel of ripening as a 
as a genre. And um, I guess I suppose it runs parallel to the Bildung Roman in a sense of uh, education and development, but we might be able to come back to that. Well, it's also a very nice to transition uh, to inviting Anne Griffin to speak. And I believe, it. so Anne is going to read something, I think, and then you're, you're going to come in and maybe ask some questions from, from, from Anne? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. So, <laughs> Anne, please, over, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Absolutely lovely to be with you all. Um, and I am um, learning so much and really um, fascinated by this area of work. And I feel really, really honoured to be, to be um, with you all today. So yes, I am going to read a, a short passage from the book. Um, and this is um, Morris when he meets um, David Flynn who is the uh, community worker from um, the seniors group in the next village over. Um, and this is a scene that I believe shows Maris Hannigan's deep vulnerability, but also his strength of character. So just be before this scene, Maris has noticed a car going up and down the road and he's getting very suspicious. He's already rung the guards but the guards aren't answering because of the cutbacks. And so he has, uh, he's now rung Robert, his solicitor friend who basically comes to his aid all of the time. Um, and he is waiting for the call back as he wonders, what is this person up to? Um, with the lace curtain between us, I saw him edge slowly on and pull into the gate of the field opposite, right in, good and tight. The door opened and out he stepped. He started to cross the road, his hand patting his left pocket. From the other, he took out his phone. Over the cattle grid he came, making his way up the drive, doing a 360 once or twice. I backed away from the window, reached for my shotgun and made my way to the back door. I hunkered down to gear stick. Gear stick's his dog, by the way. Sorry, I should have said that. I hunkered down to gear stick looked him in the eye and held his snout so he'd know to be quiet. And then we were gone, taking a right along the back and then up the side of the house. Gear stick kept pace as I held the shotgun tight. At the corner we stopped. Me pressed up against the wall and gear stick at my leg, my heart pumping away like I was running to catch the 109 to Dublin. I poked my head out, quiet like. Yeah, it's the right place, all right, I heard your man say, mooching around my front door. Looks quiet to me. I'll call you back. I watched him stick his mug up against the sitting room window, his hand over his eyes, having a good butcher's. He switched sides then, starting on the bedroom windows. I pulled back in as he made his way down to where I was waiting, looking through each window as he passed. Slowly, I took off the safety catch and raised the gun high. Gear stick's quick panting body pushed against me. I imagined his ears pricked forward. I heard the steps slow and close in. Three more, I reckoned. I nuzzled the stock on my, onto my shoulder. Three, two, one. What the fuck are you doing? My hand steady as a rock. Jesus, he shouted, jumping back. Gearstick unleashed the best bit of barking he had in him pushing the fecker until he stumbled and fell on his arse. Stood over him, his teeth bared, ready to launch once I gave the command. Don't move, I yelled, as he attempted to reach his hand inside his zippy. No, man, no, it's cool. Don't feckin' man me. Listen, man, sore, I mean sore. You have it all wrong. I'm David Flynn from the seniors club over in Duncashel. I have a badge, leaflets. My phone rang in my pocket. About second time, I said to Robert, jamming it between my head and free shoulder. I could be dead out here. This lad says his name is David Flynn from Senior or something or other over in Duncashel. Check it out and call me back. You might want to hurry, though. My finger's getting fierce sweaty on the trigger. I looked at the boy. That's all he seemed now, a terrified boy. I lowered the gun slightly. Gear stick, no longer interested in frightening the bejesus out of him either, it seemed, began to sniff at his shoes. What does the seniors club do when it's at home? I asked as we waited. We run groups. Groups? Yeah, groups, like friendship groups and arranging for people to call by to see how you're doing like. Although it mightn't be your kind of thing, he said, looking at the gun. There's bingo and yoga and outings and my phone rang. Robert again. 
I, right, I said. When he finished telling me all I needed to know about this boyo on the ground, I pressed the red button to end the call. And tell me, is this what they teach you over in Dunkashal how to frighten the shite out of a prospective client? I lowered the gun to my side. David's head dropped as gear stick whined and licked his ear. And as true as I am sitting here, the boy reached out his hand and petted him. I knew, he replied, as my hand lowered to pull him up. Thank you all for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne. That was a lovely scene um, to read out. And I was reminded that actually at the start of the novel, um, Morris reflects a bit. Um, I think he, he remembers that his son suggests that he might actually, that it might be time for him to go to oh. nursing. Oh. And, uh, what, what, what should I be doing there? Um, sitting there playing bingo with old women in cardigans, something yes. like that. So this, this already brings in the idea of, of yeah, the relevance of gender to representations of aging. And obviously my, my very obvious first question, what gave you the idea or why, why did you decide to write from the point of view um, of a man in his 80s? I mean, you could have chosen an older woman perhaps. Yeah. Or, um, it's obviously always an imaginative leap if you're a writer yeah. and, and you have to kind of um, feel your way into another person. But, but why yeah. a man in his 80s? What gave you the idea? Well, it's interesting because Morris's voice came to me very, very quickly. When I, when I realized what this book would be about, it was a man's voice that came to me quickly. And I think there are two reasons for that. Um, first of all, as a child, I was quite drawn to, to quiet men, all these quiet Irish men that would sit in rooms and hardly say a thing. But when they did say something, everybody kind of stopped and listened. And also, and I think possibly... And um, the real reason was because um, my own father was 84 at the time um, and he's 90 now, still going strong. Um, but I was very much um, a part of his world at the time, trying to help him through different issues that he was facing at the time. So his own vulnerabilities around what it was to be 84 living in Ireland. Um, so it seemed very, very natural that this this is the story I would write, that I would write the story of a male character. And at the time, I didn't realize how, un how unusual that was really to do, to do that. Um, but as I say, the voice was so naturally there and the concerns were so naturally there that it was obvious that it would have to be a man. Um, and it felt, you know, it felt as I was writing the book, it, it never at any stage did I think this was the wrong choice. It felt very, very right that it should be a man. Um, in particular, because I think um, men and and how quiet they can be within society, and I mean that in that um, they aren't always honest about what is inside. But I was I was so so keen to represent as much as I could and give voice as much as I could to some of the things that were affecting my father. Thank you. Yeah, I was very intrigued with the voice and also with the choice of point of view because really we get the interior monologue of Morris and we never oh. get side view so everything yes. in the book is filtered um through his yes perspective so even when he thinks okay what is this person thinking about me he might think i'm an old drunkard or an old nutter or whatever it's it's really his his fears that i yes. expect what others might think of him they might be thinking something totally differently exactly um, i found that really really very in, in, in intriguing and also the fact that he lays bare all his emotional life in front of the reader in a very intimate way but mm. we that it will never be told to any mm. of the who matter. Um, do you think, because he just, he can't write it down, he, he, it's just something that is going on in his mind. So do you think that that, that is a specifically, yeah, that that is a problem of masculinities and aging or masculinities in general and in Ireland specifically that emotions are not expressed? Or is yeah, um, I think, um, what I have found really interesting is since, since writing the book, I have received so many p emails from people all over the world saying, this person is my granddad or this person is my, my uncle. So I, I, you know, I think there obviously is a, a running theme out there about how much um, we all keep inside, but particularly men. Um, and I know within my own experience, my own family, um, there were a lot of... Um, there were a lot of very wise men 
um, who would share very little, but once they did, you, you felt like you were see, receiving something really important in the world. And, um, and that's, um, so I wanted Morris to be that kind of character who said very, very few things, but when he did say something, people did pay attention. Um, so yeah, I do, I do think it has been a problem within Irish society for all of the reasons that we all know, all of the historical and cultural reasons that we all know. Um, but I, I do believe that it is beginning to change to, to an extent, which is, which is really good. Um, but yes, I, I think it is, it gets reflected again and again and, and again within literature, this idea of everything we hold deep inside. And so it was really, really interesting um, to write from that first person perspective. Um, and to allow all of those inner thoughts out um, and to allow Morris the story and to allow his struggles with where he was right now as an 84 year old man be shown to the world and why he had come to that place and yes there is that it is very sad that really all all his family will ever know is that one clip at the end that voicemail that effectively he leave, he leaves so it's kind of quite symbolic of his life as a, you know in in total really yeah and it is it is an extremely sad ending so i don't know if everyone here has read the novel i won't say anything but it, it's an extremely sad ending <laughs> yes it is i mean there's always talk of make sure you have a, some tissues with you when you're reading my book but but honestly there are a few laughs in there too morris is in a and that's what I love about Mars. He is a, he's really, he is one of, he's such a strong character and he is so very clear about what he wants in the world. And at 84, he's still very clear about what he wants. He, he does not want to feel lonely anymore and he wants to have agency over his life. He wants that, de that decision to be with him, which I think is, is, is an issue. Um, and, uh, and I see it in my own family around, you know, um, as you get older, you know, and you don't have people around you all of the time who are there to maybe help you when, when there is, when you are getting more vulnerable, you know, to hold on to your choice within things is really important. Um, and, and that's what this story was about. Morris, Morris, yes, showing his vulnerabilities, having so many regrets, but still saying, this is my life and I choose what's going to happen here. An extremely important message. So thanks very much. Yeah. I have an eye on the time. So we have to stop. But I'm sure that there will be a few more questions at the end. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Great. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn back now to, to, to Tony. We've been hearing a lot about literature and indeed listening to, to, to literature. Uh, Tony, your specialization is film. So I'm, I'm guessing you might be talking to us about film. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, okay, so you're quite right insofar, and thanks very much for all those fantastically interesting and stimulating presentations so far. Um, you're quite right in that the jumping off point tends to be literature. And so my jumping off point is also literature um, because literature so dominates the notion of Irish cultural output. And I was prompted uh, to begin by thinking about the Playboy of the Western world because there was a musical version performed here in Galway only a few weeks ago. But in fact, I, thinking about it, I realized that uh, this play had held a kind of disproportionate hold over the Irish cultural imaginary um, for nigh on 120 years, well, 110 anyway. So it is not only obviously a foundational text of the Celtic revival stings Playboy of the Western world, but a prototype for aging masculinities in the Irish imaginary, a celebration of the uh, verbal exuberance of the Atlantic shore Irish its action proceeds from a portrait of a dysfunction, of dysfunctional father-son relations as its youthful protagonist, Christy, seeks to escape and uh, redefine himself independent of his old man, old man, uh, as he is called, in a riotous, literally, Oedipal struggle, blending blarney, sex, and violence. Christy describes his father during the play as a tyrannical and mean old drunk, a man who terrorized him through his childhood, but is old now. Uh, this oldness contributed to his uh, incentive to eventually kill him. This archetypal conflict between an oppressive patriarchy and youthful yearning would prove a foundational dynamic on the stages and pages of Irish drama and literature. 
throughout uh, its uh, its some hundred and some uh, years of uh, of existence to date, and familiar from the work of writers already mentioned, such as McGahern, uh, John B. Keane, of course, Eugene McCabe, and more recently, uh, Donna Ryan's novels. The older male, uh, contrary to the examples that uh, Michaela and Heather uh, uh, and Anne of course have, have mentioned, has not uh, quite figured uh, so prominently within Irish film and screen cultures, even if older male characters have maintained a steady, if largely undeveloped presence. In beginning this project, we compiled a, a database of texts featuring aging Irish masculinities. And of a hundred or so texts, less than a third of these were in the category of moving images. And additionally, within those, the range of representations of aging was extremely narrow, both in terms of character importance and age range. And indeed, in pursuing this team, it became obvious that we should probably extend our focus to consider aging in a broader sense, within the, given the predominance of middle-aged male characters and character-based stories, even if middle age itself is a broad and highly mutable character in Irish fiction film. This rather undeveloped, or maybe perhaps occlusion of the old and very old and aging as a, th as a theme might be attributed to a number of factors, I think, which have as much to do with the medium of film and TV as the culture that produces them. And although I don't have space to develop that here, I would point at perhaps three potentially contributing factors which uh, we might be able to uh, identify in other European uh, cinemas. The first of these would be the relatively late emergence of an Irish cinema in comparison with uh, other European national cinemas, uh, lasting no more than uh, about 30 or so years, beginning with the re-establishment of the Irish Film Board in 1993, although I, I, I realised there were other efforts before that. Add the small size of our national audience to this, and we find a preponderance uh, in a, a, of contemporary set narratives which focus on characters under 50 and which are increasingly aimed at a transnational audience um, for whom aging is perhaps uh, not a, a, a primary uh, con concern. To be sure there have been dramas featuring older male characters such as Da or The Field or Amongst Women but these have often been adapted from literary sources and largely maintained the patriarchal representations initiated by Singh and others. Allied to this has been a fostering of early career writing and directing by Irish state agencies, notably the Film Board, uh, again, though there are obvious exceptions. And these are again, uh, have been aimed at developing an indigenous industry, uh, aimed at, at cultivating as large a national and international audience as possible. Unlike other European film industries, Ireland has not seen the development of mature auteur artists, such as Manuel Oliveira in Portugal, or Angelopoulos in Greece, or uh, Almodovar more recently uh, in, in Spain, although he, he's, he's younger than uh, those other directors were when they made their, their final works. And finally, in relation to this theme of artistic maturity, it is the fact that although we have a deep bench of acting talent in Ireland of all ages, we have fewer leading screen actors who have aged with their audiences, a phenomenon producing a rich and increasingly visible seam of age-related stories in more developed cinemas, like, such as the UK, France, uh, and the United States, in featuring actors such as Tom Courtney, Jonathan Price, Robert Redford, Clint Eastwood, Michel Piccoli, uh, Jean-Louis Quintanon, to name but a kind of random example. A sample. But however, if fictions of male aging are relatively few uh, and rather undeveloped in Irish film, and those that exist continue to largely follow, follow their literary forebears uh, in, in terms of characterization, nonfiction or creative documentary has seen a striking uptick of interest in older men in recent time. Indeed, it might be argued that this often overlooked or somehow seen as a secondary genre provides an escape route from the rut of literary stereotypes, offering representations of male aging that are both the most varied and most socially resonant in contemporary Irish culture. And I'd like to briefly consider uh, these representations now and uh, risk hostage fortune by trying to share my, uh, my, my screen here. Um, and so you should be able to see this. And I will put this list of films up here. And then I will show this, uh, this section here. Um, and then I'll show these posters here. Great. I don't think we're we're seeing the shared screen there, Tony. Oh, sorry. 
Oh, there, there. we go. Okay. okay, great. So, uh, sorry, this is the list of titles. Are we seeing that now, uh, Dan? Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, here are some um, posters, which I'm going to categorize as, as, as group one, and then I'm going to categorize these as, uh, as group two. Okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop that then and go back to my, my notes here. So although the subjects of those films uh, that I've pointed out there, the, uh, the seven or eight uh, films, actually about nine films, um, although the subjects of those films uh, vary in age from their 60s to their 80s, collectively, I think, uh, these films offer positive images of aging masculinities uh, and, and very, very interesting ones, insofar as their subjects remain vital, engaged, and uh, independent, revising the aging patriarch uh, stereotype as well as mobilizing contemporary aging manhood in, in the broad sense of the term as a timely source of wisdom and inspiration in contemporary Ireland. We might rather artificially separate the films that I've listed into two broad overlapping categories. First, portraits of positive aging, uh, particularly among older men, older old men. And secondly, portraits of middle-aged and up uh, older men who resist or challenge hegemonic norms and structures of knowledge in Irish society of the past, present, uh, or indeed both. So within the first category then, portraits of positive aging, we could group films like The Irish Pub, Older Than Ireland, Under the Clock, and The Man Who Wanted to Fly there, along with the breakout theatrical hit uh, and the film which maybe have initiated those films, His and Hers, which focused on Irish women. These films are broadly nostalgic in tone and celebratory. They offer generous and indeed indulgent portraits of elder man, their lives, uh, their relationships, uh, and uh, their dreams. The Man Who Wanted to Fly is perhaps the standout title here, a patient and surprisingly touching portrait of the Coote Bachelor Brothers from Cavan, made over five and a half years. The film follows the rather eccentric wish of one of the brothers, uh, Bobby, who's aged 83, to pilot an aircraft. And although age is rarely mentioned in the film, it's clearly manifest in the subtext of time running out. In, this, uh, in achieving this ambition. The second group of uh, nonfiction films that I mentioned that foreground uh, aging Irish masculinities offer a noticeably different uh, tone and focus from these warm, but somewhat apolitical and uncontroversial uh, portraits. And as I said, which are, are, have a degree of nostalgia, uh, particularly around elements of mise-en-scene and setting and so on. Now, in some cases, this uh, second group can be linked and, and the, the, their different focus can be linked to their uh, fact that they deal with a younger cohort of men, 60 and above, but not, not all cases. Um, but more significantly, it relates to their positioning as men who have challenged traditional and patriarchal structures of knowledge and power and have advanced or continue to advance counter knowledges in areas relating to a politics of selfhood, psychiatry and mental health, spirituality, uh, spirituality or stewardship of place and space. These documentaries offer us aging men as figures of wisdom, not as a detached quality aloof from society, um, but as agency, as defiance, and even as great courage. The popularity uh, of these often very modestly budgeted films at national and international festivals, cinema engagements, and on Irish television suggests an appetite for such iconoclasts and figures of wisdom uh, that bespeaks of a post-Catholic and also, I think importantly, post-crash Ireland. Indeed, several of these films and individuals are distinguished by their relationship to and rejection of institutional capitalism, uh, advancing pre-Christian spiritualities, as well as uh, rejections of the dictates of late capitalism. Illustrative uh, of, of several of these films might be the, the more modest one uh, in terms of length and budget. Paul Weber, Weber's The Vasectomy Doctor, a short 11 minute film dealing with Dr. Andrew Rin, a general practitioner who is now in his 70s. Uh, Dr. Rin offered vasect vasectomies to men in the late 1980s and 90s, a time when sexual politics was utterly dominated by Catholic moral thinking. And in 1990 was shot uh, five times by a man who entered his surgery. The film offers audiences a contrary masculinity uh, that is uh, sort of uh, uh, benevolent in terms of it, it, it's shot at his kitchen table, um, but still uh, uh, principled, deeply principled. Uh, and this masculinity is primary social, social in intention, a quality shared by the uh, 
the film, the very popular Conversations with Ivor, uh, which similarly recuperated the controversial work and dissenting ideas of the now 90-something psychiatrist Ivor Brown in the treatment of depression and uh, mental, uh, mental health. Now, the other films I have mentioned also have social dimensions, but with a different emphasis, which counterpoints the importance of place and duration to economic, uh, contemporary economic agendas that deracinate and deterritorialize. Portraits of John Moriarty and Tim Robinson argue for deep archaeologies of place, while The Silver Branch and The Lonely Battle of Thomas Reed focused on uh, men resisting external attempts in both cases by the state to commodify their landscape and birthright. In their resistance to progress, these men are seen as out of time, if not out of place, calling for a reappraisal of value and our collective values. These nonfiction films thus offer us portraits that radically different, both from hegemonic masculinities, uh, Irish hegemonic masculinities, and stereotypical aging narratives of decline, as has been mentioned on a number of occasions. They find parallels and amplifications in other areas of Irish media, focusing on aging male poets and storytellers, most notably perhaps the figure of Michael Harding, a former ordained Catholic priest, who since 2013, in the aftermath of the crash, has turned away from an early career as a novelist and playwright to produce six volumes of memoir dealing with similar themes and frequently connects his ongoing wisdom uh, journey to aging. The existence of such films and uh, memoir texts celebrating men outside of traditional fictional representations, as well as the recurrence of themes of centeredness, whether that be place, mental health or spirituality, signal an interest in new narratives of Irish manhood in which aging uh, can be a central and positive force. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Sorry, fiddling with my screen there. Um, yeah, extremely interesting. You know, there's much to come back to there. Um, yeah, both about the cinema uh, and the uh, participants in it. Um, so we're going to move on to our last contribution in terms of the presentations before we get to our panel discussion. Uh, and that's a, a, a joint presentation by uh, Anya and by Maggie. So I think, Anya, I'm right that you're going to kick things off. Yes, that's right. Uh, so hello, everybody. And thanks to Dan, Tony and Michaela for organizing the event and inviting us to participate today. Our presentation will contribute to the general discussion by looking at the perspectives of older men themselves on prevalent images of aging. So at this point, I'd like to thank the men actually who participated in the study. Um, I'm Anya Nilema from the Irish Centre for Social Gerontology and Maggie is my colleague and we worked on this project together. So we're going to present initial findings from a sociological study, uh, which is part of MassGage, which has been mentioned already. So I'll start by outlining the aims of the project and the methods we used. And Maggie then will discuss the findings. So it's a cross-national study involving six countries. And uh, the findings are, these findings are from the Irish strand of the project. The aim of the project is firstly to investigate the perspectives of men aged 65 and older on the ways older men are represented in visual media. And secondly, to consider whether and how these representations affect their experiences of aging. Sociological research in Ireland has paid relatively little attention to the impact of how older men are represented in visual media. Indeed, much of the research on masculinities in Ireland has focused on younger men in their role as fathers, for example. And stereotypical portrayals of mas masculinity in Ireland tend to be synonymous with being active, strong, maybe involved in the GAA, a breadwinner, a heterosexual head of household. So older men may find themselves marginalized or excluded from such definitions. In our study, uh, the research participants identify many inconsistencies between cultural representations of older men and their own lived realities. They question some of the ways in which they're portrayed or indeed not represented at all. This suggests a need for more nuanced and inclusive representations. So the findings challenge some of the social assumptions about aging that currently appear to shape policy for older people. For example, the recent advice to all older people over 70 to cocoon during the early stages of the, of the lockdown. So back to MassGage then, what did we do in the MassGage study? 
So we conducted two focus group discussions and follow-up interviews or reflective diaries with a group of seven men aged 65 to 73 who are regular cinema goers. In the first group, we showed ads and in the second, we showed TV clips and a full length film, all featuring older men and the participants discussed them. So the questions and ads for discussion in the first focus groups were common across all the countries. So we asked, first we asked people how they felt about growing older. Then we showed three different ads from different European countries, centrally featuring older men and asked them to discuss them. Focus group two then was designed to have an Irish UK specific focus. And the content included short clips from Irish TV featuring older men. So for example, there, was, there were clips from the Irish TV drama, Fair City, and a trailer for a documentary uh, mentioned already about an older man with a dream to fly a plane called The Man Who Wanted to Fly. Participants were also shown a full length film set in the UK called I, Daniel Blake. And this provided an extended narrative of, of an older man negotiating a difficult socioeconomic climate when his health was breaking down and he also became unemployed at the same time. In both focus group sessions, participants discussed how these representations compared with their self-perception and life experiences. We also asked participants to consider the images and discussions in their own time and to record their thoughts in a diary or they could do a short interview if they prefer it. So we found that the broad questions we asked in the focus group encouraged participants to draw on their own narratives of their experiences. And the follow-up interviews and diaries provided an opportunity for further and deeper reflection. So now I'm going to hand over to Maggie to discuss the findings. You're, you're muted there, Maggie. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Anya. Hi, everybody. Um, so we'll discuss the participants' findings under the following headings. Underrepresentation and stereotyping, family roles, agency and confinement, and age as a concept. The participants noted that there was underrepresentation and stereotyping in current images of older men, and that this was more noticeable in advertising than in TV and film, which provide more variety. Some spoke about the polarized depictions of older men. For example, quote, it seems like people are either in a hospital bed or they're 75, a Harrison Ford, still out doing Indiana Jones. Their observations raised the issue of the limited representations of older men and the lack of alternatives to traditional masculinities. For example, some felt that the experiences of older gay men were not reflected. They also discussed family roles for older men, focusing on grandfather figures as underestimated or taken for granted. They tended to consider these representations realistic, but also noted that these representations overlooked a certain amount of flexibility and freedom that age afforded. Um, for instance, a Christmas ad depicting a lonely older man tricking his family into traveling to him for Christmas and a clip from a TV drama, Fair City, where older men discussed the pros and cons of traveling to family for Christmas caused participants to make connections with their own lives. They commented on the change in position of men in families with age, with one man observing that older men are, quote, moved more to the periphery. While participants found the Christmas ad stereotypical, they considered Fair City more realistic and welcomed the depiction of older men talking about issues that concerned them. Another theme that emerged was agency and or confinement. As one defined it, quote, by agency, I mean his ability to take action and to have choice. Some felt that the older men depicted were lacking agency and others disagreed. However, across discussions, participants placed value on choice in the face of changing circumstances with age. With the Christmas ad just mentioned, one man observed that, quote, at the beginning, it was like he had no option no agency 
no choice, couldn't do anything, was almost frozen in the chair. It was considered by some that, in contrast to this depiction, age could afford freedom. For instance, quote, I'm the one with the free time at this stage, so go see the kids. Similarly, an ad for running shoes in which a man appears to break free from a care home brought about a discussion about confinement. While participants were critical that the ad stereotyped older people as dependent and in decline, some found it realistic in the sense of being held back and put in a box, that's a quote. At the same time, they remained mindful of the necessity for care, which can come into tension with the desire for independence as one grows older. Finally, they discussed age as a concept. The participants interrogated the term older as generalizing. To get old, as one man stated, is a matter of perception. They emphasized the importance of staying active as well as the value of having a positive mental approach to their own aging. And they enjoyed watching corresponding representations. Um, so they upheld an image of an older Irish man learning to fly a plane, which we've mentioned, as positive, goal-oriented and bringing meaning to life. One participant observed that enthusiasm for new things is sometimes absent in portrayals of older people. And under, another noted, quote, it's usually young heroes who are doing things. There is a tendency to forget about old men who are out of sight. In conclusion, to return to our question of whether such portrayals affect older men, it is significant that, as one participant remarked, quote, when you watch something to fully engage with it, you have to believe, and you turn to the outside world, some of that must remain with you. The themes that we observed provide insight into how cultural portrayals can inform men's experiences as they negotiate the conflicting scripts of masculinity and ageing, seeking to maintain some of the expectations of hegemonic masculinity. This study demonstrates the need for further research in this area, as well as for greater diversity in media images to challenge ageist characterizations of later life. Finally, this study draws attention to the importance of autonomy for older people. At the start of COVID-19, the Irish government's approach to the protection of older people overlooked their ability to make informed decisions about their own safety. Additionally, we have seen widespread use of stereotypical images of vulnerability and dependency to represent ageing in the media. In this context, the current research could inform policy approaches to support older people during the pandemic without perpetuating reductive assumptions or diminishing individual agency. It's important to consult older people themselves to gain the perspectives. I'd just like to echo Anya's thanks to Tony, to Michaela, to Dan for hosting us today and also to the participants who took part in this study. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie, and thanks to, to Anya for that uh, closing contribution. So we're now going to move. We have a little bit of time, about 15 minutes, to uh, have a discussion. Uh, so if everybody could put their cameras back on, we'll kind of resume ourselves, so to speak, in a, in a panel discussion uh, format. Since we have a lot of participants, we may not, you know, get, get everybody involved. We'll do our, we'll absolutely do our best. Um, I definitely wanted to thank also David Kelly, by the way, in the Moore Institute, who's our Digital Humanities Manager for uh, get, keeping us on track behind the scenes and, and training us um, as he does so helpfully in so many different contexts. Um, I, I should have mentioned at the outset that I'm sure some people are joining by Facebook and they're very welcome to. Um, we had over 70 people have signed up to, as a demonstration clearly of the interest of the topic and that's been richly demonstrated in the, in the contributions uh, today. Um, I had a qu quick question for Des, um, maybe if I could start with you. Um, when, when, when is old? Um, <laughs> very much. That's a very, very, very useful and helpful question. And often one I've, I've written a little bit about this, I get somebody in their 70s still practicing a little few drinks ahead 
asking me, so, so am I old and, you know, I'm expecting to come back. And of course I say, it, it is a sociocultural con uh, construct. And for a woman actress in Hollywood, as we know, getting old occurs probably around the age of 30. Um, so I think there needs to be a, a, a mixture of both pragmatism around what older is in terms of understanding the points at which heter heterogeneity comes into play, understanding at what point negative things come into play, uh, both externally negative, but also a degree of sensitivity and sensibility. The other thing is, is also <laughs> turning the question around. And um, I was interested in the comment earlier on about Yeats' poetry becoming more youthful. And I was going, the implication of that was that youthful was somehow or other a positive aspect and actually our denial of the positivities of growing older. So the answer is there's a good, uh, there are good reasons to be looking at around 65, 70 in terms of issues that happen in healthcare, but one has to be cautious around that that might stigmatize. But on the other hand, that people would have gerontological skills which make care uh, better. So I think we need to take a life course approach that understands intergenerational, but there comes some point where it is helpful to have some pragmatic, it, it, with due caution, cutoff points. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> very interesting and helpful. Um, I, I want to turn for, to, to Anne for a moment and um, to ask you a little bit about some of the reactions that you've had, and that came up partly in Michaela's question for you, but um, did you find, and I, I'm sure you've had lots of reactions, but did you find that people were generally positive about your choice of subject matter or did they question the wisdom of it or, or why did you not do X? <laughs> um, <laughs> as people offer these sort of grandstand opinions. Mm -hmm. um, no, I have to say um, on the whole, people were just quite fascinated by the character of Morris Hannigan and were very, um, um, really enjoyed the experience of, of, you know, reading through his life in this kind of structured way. And people were very, what people were really fascinated about was the structure of the book because it's done in this kind of five toasts um, over five hours. And so it's got a really nice flow to it. But one of the things that really surprised me, and I suppose because this, uh, the, what this conference is about, is that I was rarely asked about what it was like to write an older person. Rarely. Uh, in fact, I was asked once in an, one interview, and I have done quite a few interviews about this book, mm. about older people in Irish society. And I found that fascinating because I thought I would get a huge amount more, but asked once, and I believe in Germany, um, at a festival that I couldn't make it to because of COVID, it came up as a topic there. But it has not been asked. And, and, and that, really, that really surprised me, and I, I felt quite down about that and i'd have loved it to have come up more um so i found that quite interesting that's intriguing actually yeah how, how, how interesting I'm, <laughs> and determining what that might mean of course is elusive um i was thinking mm -hmm. of recent contributions that are from a younger person talking about aging and i don't know if people are familiar with ian mulaney's book minor monuments oh it's fantastic investors. it's beautiful Wonderful. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously you're working in the domain of prose fiction. He's writing in the essay mm. form, but is very, very powerfully connected with family history, with, age, with, with dementia and other, mm. other life force uh, issues. I did want to mention that. And there was an interesting uh, comment that came in in the Q&A section from uh, Saurav Kumar, which is kind of relevant. He said, um, you know, I really liked the way Michaela addressed the relation between loss of, of of wife and lesser agency as a patriarch. Like Ireland, India has also several literary texts in English and regional languages that deal with this particular perspective. There's obviously a tremendously rich uh, comparative <laughs> dimension that, that could expand you know, enormously. Maybe it's a question for, for Tony and Michaela, partly with your project about where you see connections at the comparative dimension, either within Europe or, or beyond. Go ahead, Michaela. Yeah. <laughs> you want to answer, Tony? Should I answer? Yeah, well, you go. For, yeah, well, I mean, you should go first because you, you've done more work on, um, on, lit on literary uh, yeah. dimensions. To this, yeah, so. I, I think, I mean, aging is obviously a transcultural topic. I mean, we all age, and especially in Western cultures, of course, um, there's continually the talk about um, the kind of uh, tsunami of aging, very negative terms, as though it was a bad thing that uh, that people are getting older and the, and the burden of care. 
Um, and I think that different countries, especially European countries, Western countries face similar problems and also similar identity issues and, and concerns. And since you mentioned Dan, since you mentioned minor monuments, there's, um, there's so much writing, um, sim similar life writing about dementia, for instance, about all the people in care going on in Germany. So that actually lends itself really to a comparative angle. Actually, at the moment working on this. Mm. So um, I think there are very similar concerns there. And I mean, the mass cage project that, that Tony, Maggie, Oni and I are part of um, has this, this, this kind of um, basic premise that, that, that we're looking, that there are different teams in Europe to, looking at different contexts in, 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 in Spain, in Eastern Europe, in um, the Anglophone uh, world, Ireland and Great Britain and so on. And so, yeah, definitely. I mean, there are ver very many parallels and there's a lot of potential for comparative work. Hmm. And I think probably also a lot to be learned about different cultural relationships because we often, I think maybe particularly in the domain of aging, somehow feel bounded by cultural expectation and, and in ways that, that might might help in, in thinking that through. I don't know if you, you wanted to add anything on that. Particular well, I just, so I just wanted, I mean, in terms of cinema, what's interesting, uh, no more than any other kind of form of cultural production is that representations feed off other representations. There's a kind of chain of representation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and this is, has a particular dimension in cinema because it's iconic, you know, it shows things. And so you find uh, there's a kind of um, often a uh, subconscious to cinema. Cinema often uses images that it, that people have sort of, you know, they've dreamed in a sense in early representations. So uh, in film, what, what is quite exciting is, some, is, is the way this works in other cultures with relationship to actors. So I've been watching a lot of Michael Caine films, there's not much pain in that, but uh, you know, the, the sort of the development of, of, of a particular actor, and there's lots of examples of these types. You don't get that in Ireland, you know, so that's kind of interesting. We don't really have that kind of, so I, that was kind of what I was trying to suggest there that we, we seem a little stuck with kind of literary forebears in a sense. And what I was trying to suggest was that maybe nonfiction uh, is a way out of that rush of, of uh, previous, uh, that chain of representations. And uh, I was sort of drawn attention to this, but I have a photograph somewhere of um, uh, Hodges figures or, or Easton's and, and this huge amount of memoir, male memoir, um, and another area that I'm sort of interested in uh, would be, say, that, say, Tommy Tiernan's TV show, which is really, really popular and taken off. And, there's, and, and Michael Harding, who I sort of am very interested in. There, there are these really interesting ma men around Irish culture. And I think that's uh, older men who, pe who, who really appeal across a broad range of, of um, audiences. And this seems to me to be fairly uniquely Irish. I mean, you don't find that kind of thing in France or in, in Britain in quite the same way. So uh, maybe, maybe that's kind of uh, where, where some of the research is going. So what I'm saying is there is a transnational, which is kind of horizontal, which is really exciting about age, but then there's kind of vertical things, which is sort of particular cultural um, traditions and, and chains. Yeah, I thought that was extremely interesting what you were saying about, and I certainly hadn't thought of it, about uh, following an actor's career um, mm. over their development. And I was thinking of a couple of actors who died fairly young, who would have been interesting. Donald McCann and Ray McAnally, I think, would have been quite mm -hmm. interesting, potentially. Yeah. Um, it's also, I suppose, the nature of careers of people. I mean, well, Pierce Brosnan might be interesting, but it's not identified as an Irish actor in quite... Well, that's yeah, so the example there, obviously, uh, the, the, the most obvious example is Liam Neeson, who looks amazing and who is, you know, there's a, the genre of the so-called Jerry Action film. And, and the Jerry Action film is sort of pioneered by this Irish guy who, who doesn't take no for an answer. And McCann was interesting because he made uh, The Dead, of course. And very soon after that, the last play I saw him in, the last thing he ever did was The Steward of Christendom. Uh, uh, Michael has already referred to uh, Sebastian Barry, and he played an old, a much older man in that, uh, a man in prison. So he would have, he would have been a very, very interesting man to have kept up with. There are other, there are, there is a long tradition of Irish stage actors to grow old on the stage, and and some of those actors are still working, but we haven't quite had that follow through uh, in cinema for reasons I I explained. Yeah, very interesting. I wonder, uh, you know, Heather, if I could could ask you, uh, such, as I say, such an interesting curriculum that you were providing, mm -hmm. um, and then with Tony's contribution was suggesting maybe a, maybe a disjunction almost between what goes on in certain certain creative domains that that film film and perhaps television is slightly different. So, do you see differences of art form, say, between the novel or or drama? 
on this specific question. You mentioned short stories, of course, as well. So I'm just interested in kind of teasing that out a little bit, whether there's different locations, perhaps, uh, in which that this theme can be more fully explored. Um, well, in the novel, you can have these more extended life narratives and an older male, char male character, for example, in Banville's novels, um, reflecting over the whole of his life. And you get um, what I think Lynn Seagal has talked about, layers of memory. Um, and, and in fact, you get this in portraits of um, older female characters as well in Irish fiction. So you have um, a potential in the novel for really rich layering um, in these kind of life narratives, looking back over their lives. Um, I mean, I think when the life review was was brought in, it was supposed to be a kind of healing thing, but it isn't always in Banville, for example, as I said, that it can be unsettling to go back over your life, or it can lead to regrets, or the other thing is it can be end stopped, which is also a danger that you feel you haven't got anything more to do, that you've yeah, come to the end. Uh, so there's, a, yeah. Uh, so I think the novel is very rich, can be very rich in this. Uh, whereas the short story, as I kind of tried to briefly indicate, is um, you, you can only get a sort of mini flashback. But sometimes it works very well in the uh, stories, particularly of uh, John McGahan and William Trevor, the older male characters. You can get a depth into that, even if it's only a flashback to one particular. Um, episode in the past life. Uh, some of those stories get a sort of depth into that. Thank you. And, and the, actually, I think there's this takes us to a slightly different question, which is, in fact, has come up in the, in, in the question section, and I wanted to ask about it. Um, Jose Diaz Cuesta has asked about, he's saying, I'm thinking, for example, the relationship between grandparents and children here in Spain, he's writing from. And I was thinking also about aging and generations. And perhaps it's a question for, for, for Anya and, and Maggie. Did it come up in your, your interviews, uh, again, how, how re generational relationships are working and how that, how that becomes a part of the story of aging or, or were you focusing on the other questions perhaps? Well, Maggie or Anya wants to come in on um, that. I, well, I, I'll come in and then you can, you can uh, see what I haven't said, Maggie. Um, Okay, so they, um, yeah, they, uh, they did speak a lot about, the men did speak a lot about um, their role in families, I think Maggie mentioned it, um, and how, yeah, there was a lot about try, trying to, um, I mean, there was an ad about somebody coming home for Christmas, and they did speak a lot about, um, they felt they were more actually more active, they, they would be more proactive than, than it was portrayed on the in the ad. And uh, yeah, so it wasn't so much about, um, well, actually that one was directly about um, their other family members who were living overseas. And, uh -huh. but yeah, it wasn't a very flattering um, picture of an older man. He had to trick them into, he pretended he was dead and they all they all came home for Christmas. So, um, Maggie, did you have, you have any other, uh, they they do them. They spoke well about. Um, I remember one or two of the men talking about how having a younger generation around made them feel younger, um, as well. Mm -hmm. You know, ha have having, um, um, you know how how it was you know part of maintaining a sort of positive mental approach to age that that having youth around. And the opportunity to visit grandchildren, grandchildren, or to see young people around, make them feel younger. But you know, as, as Anya mentioned, they also spoke about how their position in the family changes over time. So one of the men mentioned how you know his role had moved from the centre more so to the periphery, and that maybe that wouldn't have been the way in the past. Maybe years ago, the older generation would have stayed more central. But um, as things have changed over time. They might be living in a different country, um, they might be, you know, um, in a care home. And um, so they, they did speak about how things had changed uh, as that they'd observed, you know, um, from the previous generation. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I see, Tony, you're sharing your screen again. Was there, a, did you want to draw our attention to uh, 
one of these film contributions in that context? No, no, I, I just in case uh, people didn't, didn't know from overseas the films that I was talking about, yeah. You no, know, if you were editorializing there in <laughs> covert <laughs> fashion. Uh, we're coming towards the end. I did want to um, mention a very interesting comment and question that came in from our, our colleague Tina Karen Pussa. Um, it's complex and it's uh, difficult to uh, maybe to do, do justice to, but I'll read it out. Uh, she said, there's so much discussion recently about the, quote, emotional load women carry in heteronormative relationships. I wonder uh, if the increased vulnerability of aging, especially widowed men, has to do with the sudden withdrawal of this dimension of care, i.e. misplaced parenting. Uh, she adds that many of those aging men narratives portray men in a way that I would almost describe as orphaned. The helplessness, the deterioration, the inability to address emotional needs. Um, I mean, that's <laughs> very interesting and challenging comment, I think quite difficult to, to, to do justice to, but I thought maybe I might come back to Des just on that kind of specific issue about care. It's really a question for everybody, I think, and it's come to our attention in, in an extremely vivid way, so could, if I could put it that way, in, in the COVID-19 crisis about the demands of care, about how, uh, how those who are aging are, are, are dealt with and are physically located. So I don't know, Des, if it's maybe unfair to ask you to comment, comment on that, but if you had any no, no, it's big and complex. A couple of things. First and foremost, nothing worse than hearing care being referred to as the care burden. Care is part of our moral development, is intergenerational. So actually burdensome aspects of care I'm good with. Um, I think the other thing is to uh, the humanities and arts uh, give us insights into teasing out perhaps romantic ideas of filial piety. I think of Rohinton Mysteries, Family Matters, for example, the compulsory altruism very often foisted on daughters and daughters-in-law. But lastly, where care should have been needed, uh, certainly the great revealer, COVID, showed that we had um, uh, neglected due protocol um, and, and appropriate care, certainly in the nursing home sector. So interesting, really important that we try to somehow or other norm normalize uh, due and appropriate care as not something ex an extraordinary demand, but also to recognize the uh, two-way process of care as an important for all of us. Thank you very much. Um, I think we should draw to a close there. We did have a late question coming in about um, grandparents living in other, in other countries and some of the questions that are posed by that. I think it really that just suggests, as indeed the panel as a whole did, that there's so many different areas that we need to respond to and think about. Um, it's been tremendously interesting to, to have this, I guess, opening session and really promises a great deal for the future of these conversations and indeed the research. I think, uh, Michaela, you were going to say a little something about the next uh, sort of steps, I believe, in, in, in the research project? Yeah, we're also planning um, to um, edit um, a collection, an edited collection on the theme of aging masculinities in Irish literature and culture. Um, so if anyone would still like uh, to contribute something to this, we're still open to submissions and we're also going to have another workshop on the Irish theme later in November. The date is not finalized. I think we set something around the 20th November, Tony, didn't we? And um, so if anyone is interested in this, um, just get in touch with Tony and myself. And you might still we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a, another webinar like this format, uh, quite short presentations, a number of perspectives um, on European cinemas uh, and, and all moving image cultures in uh, November as well. Um, just to flag that now. Thank you. You've given us a great deal to look forward to. Um, the recording of today's session will be available on the Moore Institute site. So uh, do recommend that to people who may not have been able to join us live today. It just remains to thank all of the panelists and indeed the organizers uh, for a wonderful session. And um, as I say, a lot to think about and a lot to look forward to. So thank you again very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.